one that I personally think is very, very important, which is the topic of flourishing. Um, mindfulness dedicated to flourishing and the path dedicated to flourishing. And the reason I personally want to speak about this is as a corrective to the idea that, that this practice, uh, mindfulness practices, the path, um, however you want to refer to it, is actually just a way of overcoming problems. It's actually something far greater than that. And this is particularly where I think we should be looking at not just overcoming problems, but really beginning to live um, and live in a way that's non-reactive. Yeah, this has been one of the big themes. Um, we had it this morning with Vedana causing reactivity to the pleasant and the unpleasant, being pushed and pulled by the vicissitudes of life, by the movement of life as it unfolds uh, and just reacting to it. So we become very Pavlovian in that sense of not having much freedom because there is no space between an event and our reactivity. There is no literally space for attention. There is no space to contemplate what, um, what could be our possible options of what to do in any particular instance. I think flourishing is also deeply linked to leading perhaps something <laughs> which is very unfashionable these days is, but I would say is, is vitally important, leading an ethical life. Um, you know, this is an enormously important part of what this path was about. It was a transition um, in the original early text from that which was unwholesome and a movement towards that which was wholesome in your life. Now, whether we take this figure of the Buddha as being um, you know, historical character or not, it's really unimportant. What he represents, as many figures of, you know, um, great figures within religious thinking have done, is he represents something to be aspired to. And this, this is particular, particularly the case in early Buddhism where there isn't a real notion of a transcendent, something beyond, you know? And the path is not laid out as a way to be beyond the earthly, but an affirmation of this earthly life and the way that we live. And so this figure of Gotama, the Buddha, I mean, Gotama was his actual name. Um, the figure of the Buddha is representative of what it means to live a real human life and nothing else. Yeah? It wasn't uh, a sense of somebody who was so far beyond nobody else could be aspire to be like that. It was a figure. And you know, if you go to traditional cultures, you'll find statues of the Buddha, which are really there as inspirations to kind of live that kind of life. Um, and I would say this is no different from often other religious traditions or non-religious traditions come to that. Um, we, we take inspiring figures and we use them as a way of you know, motivating ourselves and inspiring ourselves to live a very different life. So really what I want to say at this stage is that the path of mindfulness is a path of remembrance. And going back to something we said last night, it's a path of remembering, remembering where we are, what we're doing, how we're living. And it's not just a path of overcoming difficulty. There is that part to it as well, and we analyze um, within this tradition, we analyze difficulty to a great extent, but that's not wholly the focus. That's not really the goal of what we're actually aspiring to. The sumum bonum of, of all of this is something you will have heard of. I mean, it's one of these words that's entered into the English language, despite the fact it's not in English, it's a, it's a Sanskrit word, which has an earlier derivation in, in this original language called Pali, which is the word Nirvana or Nirvana. And Nirvana is often perceived of as being some kind of mystical condition to which you aspire to get to the end of this path. That is not actually how it's conceived of at all. Nibbana is an activity that goes on in life. And it's the ability to unbind ourselves from re reactive behaviors. 
Yeah? And this is what Nibbana represents. It's the ability to cut or unbind ourselves, untie ourselves from that push-pull of reactivity that we seem so deeply bound to in ordinary life. Just one final comment before I pass it over to Christina, which is that the path of Nibbana is a strange path, really, because, you know, it's a path, if you tend to think of the metaphor of a path, it's usually leading from A to B. This is a strange path, because there's where do you want to get with the particular path of meditation and mindfulness and greater awareness and everything? You don't want to get anywhere, you want to get to where you are already and understand it in a completely different way, a reinvigorated way, a much more engaged way, a much more ethical way and wholesome way of living. And this is what the path is dedicated to. And this comes with the taste of what he said the, the teaching was really about, which is it comes with a taste of freedom and that freedom is the freedom from reactivity. Christina. Hey, a few reflections I'd like to share. I mean, my reading of the teaching is that the Buddha was deeply committed to human flourishing, to supporting and guiding people to be the creative, skillful, insightful, engaged, compassionate human beings that we have the potential to be. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that in this practice, including in contemporary mindfulness practices, we are always cultivating this word John mentioned earlier today, this word bhavana. We are always teaching ourselves and teaching our clients and students to cultivate that which is lovely, to cultivate that which is healing, to cultivate that which is liberating. The Buddha was not only concerned with individual flourishing, he was equally concerned with the, the flourishing of societies, the flourishing of communities, really acknowledging that none of us walk this path alone. None of us is an island. We are always interconnected. And it seems at, time that, at times that we either flourish and awaken together or we kind of sink and disintegrate together. So much of the Buddhist teaching was about taking care inwardly, but taking care of the world around us, taking care of the people around us. Um, I'm somewhat convinced, although this is obvious a speculation, that if the Buddha was alive today, he would be teaching also environmental ethics. Um, so we look at this path of flourishing. You know, I find that many people speak to me about their practice. I don't find that so many people speak to me about their path. And yet the reality is that we cannot just highlight practice and somehow think that the rest of our lives doesn't matter. Because what happens for us on cushions or in walking paths is always being informed by what is happening for us in the rest of our lives. So when the Buddha speaks about the path, he's looking at a whole human life, you know, how we speak, how we think, how we engage with the world, the kind of livelihoods we undertake, to actually sort of bring together this sort of integrated picture or this integrated pathway that is moving towards and practicing, as John says, moving towards Nirvana. I want to share with you a quote I have come across that I find quite helpful. And the Buddha says, this noble life we live does not have gain or honor or renown for its benefit or its goal or the attainment of virtue, concentration or knowledge as its goal. But it is this unshakable liberation of the heart that is the goal of this noble life, its heartward and its end. And I would agree with John very much that it's very important not to sort of idealize nirvana as some you know looking for our own bodhi tree moment you know i think that we we are always practicing something we are always practicing something either consciously or unconsciously 
intentionally or impulsively. We are always in every, in every moment through our speech, through our thoughts, through our acts, we are practicing something. And what is clear to us in our lives is that whatever we practice, we get better at. Whatever we practice, we get better at. You know, whether it's a skillful or unskillful. You know, as, as the Buddha put it in the early teachings, that that which we frequently think about and dwell upon, to this does the mind incline. You know, whatever we frequently think about and dwell upon, to this does the mind incline. So whatever we most frequently practice in body, speech, and mind, in a way, this is, this is almost kind of creating a groove or an inclination that it is easy to default into. I mean, I think we know that if we practice aversion frequently, it becomes easier to be angry. You know, if we practice generosity frequently, it becomes easier to be generous. You know? If we practice kindness frequently, it becomes easier to find that kindness accessible to us. So the question I think that is raised in this practice and in this path, and I much prefer to use the word path, the question that is being raised in every moment is, what is it that we are practicing? That which leads and is a practice of happiness and leads to happiness. It is, as the Buddha put it, this is a practice of happiness that leads to the highest happiness. What are we, are we practicing unhappiness? Are we practicing sufficiency or are we practicing insufficiency? It is, as we know, so easy to, to deepen these neural pathways and habit patterns, but it is also easy to forge new neural pathways and helpful ways of being in this world. This waking up it is, is a process. It is a process. And, you know, it's a process that we see, you know, markers on that path. You know, we see markers on that path. In truth, people in practice do see things weaken and fall away. You see things weaken and fall away. You know, I, I think it's so important, you know, it, it, you know, I know when people come into eight-week programs, you know, that they're, they're very much told to sort of, you know, not hold big expectations, you know, to, to however it unfolds, it is as it is. But the truth is that nobody comes into an eight-week program and nobody comes into a retreat or a practice environment with the hope of staying the same. And I don't think any of us are particularly interested in simply being more intimate with our, our struggles and our you know, cycles of repetition and our habit patterns. The truth is that we are actually looking for flourishing. And, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that and to respect that aspiration, you know, to honor that, that aspiration. People who come into eight-week programs are looking for wellness. They're looking for flourishing. And I think it is so deeply important to honor and to respect that and to not feel that that automatically has to turn into striving or comparing or judgment. It all depends on how it is held. Depends on how it is held. So there's this one more thing I want to remark on before handing back to John. Again, looking at this word bhavana, cultivating. Cultivating the lovely, the healing, the liberating. It is what the path is concerned with. But I think that path of cultivation really requires, as John has mentioned, a considerable reorientation in our thinking. Because I think that we, I feel that we often approach this path with an almost toxic storm of conditions um, that it's not easy to shake off. You know, we, we have the, uh, the deeply ingrained work ethic that we inherit in our society. You know, we work on things, you know, and we're good workers, you know. We have negative attentional bias, which tends to highlight that which is broken and imperfect. So that gives us plenty to work on, doesn't it? And then we have often inwardly and outwardly generated images of perfection, you know, 
And that's what we idealize at the end of this working. Um, you know, I, I, for many people, it's such a rare, rare experience, for example, to come to a retreat without having a project that they're working on. You know, the meditation projects, you know, that people will say to me, you know, I'm working on my greed, you know, or I'm working on my, my rage, you know, or I'm, I'm working on my anxiety. And I kind of wonder, how do you know when you've finished working on things, you know? And, and it can, you know, it, it can become so over earnest, you know, and at times so joyless in a way, because I've got so much to work on, you know, the, the coal face is so big, you know, and I feel like I'm chipping away and chipping away only to, un to uncover another layer of something to work on. So what I read in the teaching is this invitation to a reorientation, to not approach this path as yet another project of self-perfection. Not, not another project of self-improvement, but to approach this path as one in which there is moment to moment a cultivation of all of the qualities that support flourishing. The cultivation of the lovely, of the healing, of the liberating. And there's what I read in the text, that it is the cultivation of all of this that helps us to flourish that really allows for the falling away of the dukkha creating patterns within us. That it is the cultivation of the lovely that allows that, that fading and falling away of all of the patterns that entangle us. So it's not that we are doing the work. It's not that I've succeeded in annihilating something. It is because there has been that effort and that dedication to cultivating the understanding and the qualities of heart that liberate, that the unskillful and the unwholesome can find no foothold. You know, I'm reminded of a, a story from the text where the, the Buddha is on wandering on, on one of his, he's wandering in the woods and he comes across a person standing on one leg. And the, the Buddha asks the person, you know, what are you doing? And the person answers, well, I'm working out my karma. You know, and the Buddha says, well, how much have you got rid of? And, and, and the man answers, he says, I have no idea. You know, and the Buddha says, well, how much have you got left to go? And the man answers, well, I have no idea. And then the Buddha asks, well, how will you know when you're done? And the man answers, well, I have no idea. You know, and this is where the Buddha launches into one of his tirades of, you know, you foolish man on, on, on a, a path that takes you nowhere. But can we make that reorientation? Do we have the trust and the confidence that in the cultivation of the qualities that lead to flourishing, that which causes distress and difficulty and struggle will fall away? I would also just mention that this cultivation of the qualities that are lovely and healing and liberating are woven into each week of the eight week program without actually naming them as such. Okay, John, I'll turn it all back over to you. Okay. Well, I'll pick up on this notion of cultivation because I think it's a very, very important notion. As Christina rightly says, cultivation is. <laughs> is something that we're growing in our lives. It's not something that's just given to us. It's, you know, the, the historical circumstances in which these teachings were given were very much within an agrarian society. You know, people understood about growing things. Um, so if you like, the metaphors that are used and often very agrarian horticultural metaphors, you know, you grow something. Uh, and you watch it grow, you feed it, you tend it, you care for it. Um, and these are metaphors about this cultivation, about what the real aim of the practice is, which is wakefulness, to wake up. And one of the ways it's often formulated is actually wake up, to really flourish in this world is to wake up to the way things are. Yeah? Not the way I would like them to be, the way they actually are, the way that we encounter them in our day-to-day -day existence. There's a quote I want to give you now, which I think shows, in a sense, our 
forgetfulness and the ways that we we move through the world in certain patterns. Um, and it could have been written by a Buddhist, but it wasn't. It was written by Thoreau, um, who wrote a book some of you might know called Old Walden Pond, where he had these sort of contemplations and, and meditations himself about life. And this quite quote might be known to some of you. He said, the mass of people lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city, you go into the desperate countryside. Unconscious despair is concealed even under what you call your games and amusements. There is no play in them, but it is characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. I mean, it could have really easily been written by certainly somebody within the Buddhist tradition, but it wasn't. And I think that shows you we don't just have to look at this tradition to find similar things being said. But this is often our drivenness. Yeah. Our drivenness, driven by the patterns of trying to look for something to satisfy, to make our lives flourishing. But of course, we do this in very unskillful ways because we don't see clearly. We don't wake up to the way things are. We still grasp after certainties when there is a huge lack of certainty in this world. We grasp after permanence when there isn't permanence to be found in this world. Yeah? Because we're looking for ways of finding stability, and these are all laudable things of stability and growth and security, uh, freedom from fear. We're looking for those things, but unfortunately, we do them in ways which are not attentive or wakeful to the way things actually are. And what is being suggested in this path is to wake up to the way things are and to actually start to affirm the way they are is to actually live in a realism as opposed to a fantasy. We can have the fantasies of security, permanence, and all of the things perhaps we long for, but we won't find them in a world that is changing. And so we desperately look for it. I mean, I think the word that Thoreau uses here is a very good word. We desperately search for it. We desperately search for it in the countryside, we search for it in the city, we search for it in our amusements and our play and our games, but we don't find it. We don't find that security, we don't find that resting place. Because actually we live in the forgetfulness of the way things are. So simply we do not flourish. The word flourishing is an interesting word because it's usually, it actually comes from the Greek word eudaimonia, which actually um, is the word that really is the epitome of virtue in Greek thought. Yeah. It's not actually a word that's used a lot in early Buddhism, but it's implicit within this path. Eudaimonia really indicates a life that is well lived. A, a life that is fruitful, a life that is virtuous. Again, not a very fashionable word these days, a very, un, sort of very unfashionable word to talk about virtue and character. Um, but this is what the waking up process is helping us to, in some sense, cultivate a sense of virtue, a sense of our character, of our being here in this world. And noticing often things which give us meaning, but remain ignored, unnoticed, looked over, overlooked by our, our desperation to grasp after the familiar. So flourishing itself is only going to occur when the waking up process. Now waking up, we might think of again as the sort of big bang theory of nirvana. You, know, you get to the end of the path and suddenly it comes upon you. No, it's incremental. It's something which is occurring as we move, as we develop. I use the phrase which was picked up in the group this afternoon of sifting gold. Yeah. You know, to get the big nugget of gold is very unusual, but we accumulate it in those little things, in those little moments of awareness, when we begin to see meanings in things that we didn't see them in before. And so only by that process, that simple 
gradual incremental basis does this waking up process occur and this is the goal the goal is to wake up the goal is not to become enlightened and this is open to everybody and as christina rightly says it's there within the eight week path obviously we don't make a thing about it in the eight week course the eight week course is in a sense um well it is not even in a sense it's a secular approach to this but I think all of the same facets are open to those who wish to explore it. Yeah. One other thing I think is really important to notice within the traditional approach to this is being a human and the potential that our humanity gives us, or at least has the potential for, isn't a given. It's something we aspire to. We aspire to being fully human as opposed to actualizing it. Sometimes we find ourselves falling into states which are far less than human in our greed, in our aversion, in our blind ways of moving through the world. We, you know, we throw, show anger, we show animalistic characteristics, we very rarely aspire to the potentials of what being human really means, certainly within this uh, particular path, which is to be human is, is actually fundamentally based on kindness. Yeah? It's based on our sense of being with others and caring for ourselves and for others, not preferring one over the other, but together. This is what human flourishing is. And this takes us into a world the world of ethics, the world of what it means to live a good life, because actually that's all ethics means. Unfortunately, in the Western world, when we tend to think of ethics, what we tend to think of is a list of rules and regulations and prescriptions about what we do. Now, in this particular approach, that isn't the case. Ethics is based on how is it best to live? Yeah? How is it best to live and approach the context in which we find ourselves. Because each context in which we find ourselves will demand something differently from us, yeah? which simply can't be covered by a rule. Yeah? Unfortunately, rules have a way of contradicting themselves at times. You know, always telling the truth is not necessarily a good idea. Yeah? In fact, truth can be used as a very damaging um, very painful and hurtful thing if used wrongly uh, in a context where it's not appropriate. Yeah. So what we're talking about is living a life which actually starts to support that growth of our humanity, that growth of becoming fully human in this world. And in, as I said earlier on, in you know, when, when I opened up, that the Buddha in this tradition doesn't represent a superhuman being, a super being, I should say. What he represents is the fulfillment of living a really human life. Now, obviously, this is contextualized in a very different con context than the one that we live in. You know, India two and a half thousand years ago is very different from 21st century Ireland or the UK or whatever. It's very, very different. But there's still that task of waking up what it means to be fully human in this life. Just one final comment about this is that that path isn't actualized unless we start to learn something. And this is again, something that actually gets forgotten within the way mindfulness is often described. Mindfulness appears to be something which if we pay attention to something, then it will change and it will drop away or whatever and, and our lives are going to change, no. It's by the repeated, in a sense, looking at, being aware of what is actually going on, that we start to learn something. And it's that learning that will produce the change. Yeah? If you didn't learn anything, you wouldn't change. As Christina quite eloquently put it, in a way, it's just like looking at your own mess and getting a better idea about your own mess, but not being able to do anything about it. Now, we all know that's not what flourishing is about. Flourishing is learning something and learning to apply it, to unbind ourselves from those patterns that we normally are entangled in. And we are all patterned. We are patterned 
both by our societies. So it's not all our fault. Uh, we are patterned by our backgrounds and our education. We're patterned by our race and our gender uh, and our cultures and our languages. You know, we're patterned by all sorts of things. And then we're also patterned by our individual history. So actually waking up to a lot of that is what this is about. You know, the ways that we are pushed into being in a certain way because of that unexamined background, yeah, which is influences. In other words, we're being spoken by our histories, whether that be a cultural history, a racial history, a linguistic history, we're being spoken by that rather than speaking it. Yeah. It's determining us. And so a flourishing life is a life that is not simply determined. It's not simply a life which is fated to unfold in a certain way. Christina, I'm sure you've got something to add to that. Waking up, I think, is a very noble aspiration, but I'm sure we all realize the path is not that easy. You know, we have moments of delight and joy and stillness and peace. And there are moments of despair and doubt and, uh, you know, self-blame. It can feel a little bit like a roller coaster. But it is a process. We appreciate the challenge of emerging from a habit-driven life into a life of wakefulness. And I, too, would just like to reflect on some of the cultivations or some of the qualities we cultivate that I think really support and lead to this, this sense of flourishing, this sense of deepening. The first of these John has actually spoken about already quite substantially that uh, the ethical, an ethical life. You know, ethics in the Buddhist tradition are not meant to induce guilt or shame or self-blame. They're meant to guide us to a way of being in this world, a way of engaging with this world in which the footprint we leave is very light. In which the footprint we leave is very light. And sometimes when the Buddha would speak about ethics, he would speak about it as thoughts, words and acts of kindness. Personally, I find this something wonderful to aspire to. It's not that I am successful in every moment. I mean, there are, I have to confess, there are moments I have thoughts that are not particularly kind, but I know them. I know them. And you know what they induce? They induce in me a kind of sense of, ah, you know, that uh, there's this term of in Pali of heriotoma, you know, this sort of the, the red flush of knowing you've lost your moral compass, the knowing of you've lost your ethical compass. And that's not a point of blaming. It's a point of resetting that ethical compass. And to know that this, this, this happens, this is a process. Thoughts, words, and acts of kindness. I find this something quite powerful to aspire to in the midst of all things. You know, in the midst of all things. I mean, I, you know, during this last lockdown, my, one of my close neighbors has had pretty much a, lockdown meltdown which has you know led to some pretty strange behaviors but to try and sustain the perspective of his suffering you know this is not how he wants to live he can't help himself you know he can't help himself thoughts words and acts of kindness one thing i'd like to mention in terms of this process of change and transformation. You know, I think sometimes we, we have the view that we're going to come to these wonderful startling insights, which sometimes happens, and then they're going to be somehow embodied or manifested in our thoughts, words, and acts. That is one, one avenue of waking up. But the other avenue of waking up that's really also emphasized in the early teachings is through behavioral change. You know. I act with kindness, even if I don't feel particularly kind. You know, I will speak with kindness, even if I don't feel particularly kind in that moment. Um, and if I do this, I see the benefits. 
it doesn't get into pretending or art if something artificial but in those moments my mind catches up that actually this is the wisest way the noble most noble way of living in this world so sometimes we do behavior change through behavior not just change from the inside out it's why we put a lot of emphasis on postures of sitting and walking even if we don't feel like it yes we do it you know we do it and eventually we catch up that this actually might be a good idea so this ethical ground is a ground actually of all transformation i don't think there's any real change that happens uh, in this one point this is described as the joy of blamelessness it's, it's how we liberate the mind from the whole world of shoulds and if only and i wish that hadn't happened or i wish that hadn't been said you know it's where we begin to actually lay down some of that burden actually of self-blame and self-judgment it's a ground upon which we begin to flourish we sleep better some of us another of the qualities that I think is just I have found really so important to cultivate is the quality of contentment you know when I first lived in India like John you know in the in the early 70s you know I had very little money and India was very poor and Basically, 99% of the time, I think I never got what I wanted. You know, if I wanted a certain kind of food, it didn't happen. If I wanted health, it didn't happen. You know, if I wanted quiet, it didn't happen. You know, I lived in this world of actually never getting what I wanted. Um, and it was such a powerful lesson for me, you know, especially as a, you know, a privileged Westerner you know, used to being able to sort of order the conditions of my life to get a lot of what I wanted, suddenly to find that that didn't happen. And that if I was really going to learn something and continue to learn something in the way that I wanted to learn, I really needed to cultivate this sense of contentment. And it has been such a powerful lesson in my life. You know, even, even during the lockdowns, this was so helpful, you know. Oh, no flour in the stores this week? Oh, that's fine. We can live without flour, you know. Oh, no bread this week? Oh, that's okay. We can do without bread, you know. Oh, no eggs this week? Oh, that's all right. We can live without eggs. It was actually so helpful. And it's also appreciating how much discontent can make our lives so miserable. You know, discontent, the feeling of just not getting what I need, not getting what I want, not being the kind of person I want to be, not having the life I want to have. Discontent can make us so miserable. And we're not talking about a kind of bovine contentment here. You know, where we're just sort of passively moving through life, chomping away at the grass in front of us. We're talking actually, I think, more about a sense of sufficiency, a sense of having enough. You know, so much discontent is really rooted in this sense of inner lack, isn't it? I don't have what I need. I'm not the kind of person I need to be. I don't have everything I need to have. So much of, of discontent is rooted in this sense of inner deficit. This is also what provokes craving, yeah? provokes a craving impulse. And I think that the, the gist of this teaching, the gist of this path and to practice this practice is to begin to develop that sense of sufficiency inwardly. You know, I'm, I'm not invulnerable to the world of conditions. But I don't need to spend my life trying to rearrange the world of conditions. Some things I do need to rearrange. If some things are harmful or, you know, injurious to the planet or whatever, I do need to rearrange them. But that's different than the busyness of trying to rearrange conditions so that I get what I want, that I somehow feel this sense of lack. I think there's something about practicing sufficiency. You know, it has a lot to do with this training and mindfulness about learning to, to rest in the moment, to calm the agitations, 
to begin to see and listen wholeheartedly, to touch the world wholeheartedly, and to be touched. And we find, you know, we come across these, these moments of joy, these moments of sensitivity, these moments of easefulness, in which we actually really feel there is enough in this moment. No, there is enough in this moment. I do have everything I need for inner peacefulness, for stillness, for compassion, for care, for a sense of relatedness. So contentment is something we, we cultivate. There's a wonderful Zen koan where we're invited to pause in moments of agitation and ask of ourselves, what in this moment is truly lacking? So I'll hand back to John. Yes, I'd like to pick up on what Christine is saying there, because again, this is another important facet of what um, this flourishing is about, is, you know, for example, we can take this path as being something we look forward to and expect to find fulfillment in, in the future. It's out there ahead of us. You know, if I practice long enough, I will find eventually a goal, which is, you know, in the Buddhist tradition is the, the moment of nirvana. Or I practice in such a way as I wake up finally um, as a final goal. But this is not the case. Everything that you need for the waking up process is here in this moment. Um, the philosopher Nietzsche in his Also Spark Daratustra actually speaks about a gateway that we all pass through. And the future stretches out in front like a long road. The past stretches infinitely backwards in terms of our culture and our determining factors and that. But it passes through a gateway. And that gateway in German is labeled Augenblick, which actually means moment. It means literally the blink of an eye. Yeah. That, that is the moment, that's the only place with that we really live is in that moment. And so waking up is not future, waking up is now. Yeah? And it's not waking up in this big sense. We tend to get this overblown conception of what, what it would really mean to flourish. It would be that noticing, that feeling perhaps of compassion, that feeling of non-reactivity that might come through seeing how deeply bound I am and just being able to sever the cord uh, that ties me to certain forms of, of thinking and behavior. But it's not just about elimination. It's not just about eliminating that. What is opened up when we sever those cords that tie us to certain forms of behavior? In a way, the term practicing is good, in, in the formal practices that we do, because what we're practicing to do is to see more clearly, yeah? A clear understanding of what is there and what things sometimes we overlook. All too often, the beginnings of a meditation session seem like a checklist. You know, I go through looking at the touch of the clothing on my body, my buttocks sitting on my seat and my feet on the floor and that okay I've done that okay I'll now get on with my breathing it's as if it's a checklist but this is really actually a call to really wake up to those simple things which you know the breath is is unique it's complex it differs in each moment each breath is different and also each breath will never return not that breath that's gone yeah, the moment of waking up is the moment when we really begin to affirm what is there for us in our lives. Now that might be, and, and I'm really speaking about those who are not in terrible conditions. Yeah, those who are in terrible conditions that often need much more basic things. You know, in many ways, I think these teachings really find a foothold in the West because actually most of us are not in those terrible, certainly physical conditions that many of the world live in and don't have the time to deal with this sort of thing. Let's not forget about that. You know, the majority of human beings do not have those conditions whereby we, they can do something like this. Yeah. 
yet they still live compassionately. They still laugh. They still have joy in their lives, you know, despite those conditions. And I'm sure Christina would echo this, that we've all seen people living in terrible conditions sometimes in India, but still enjoying themselves, still appreciating aspects of life. Yet we get ourselves into a dialogue of what we don't have and what we would need to make our lives much more fulfilled, much more flourishing. And generally, if you ask the average person, what would you need to flourish in life? They'd probably give you a whole list of gadgets <laughs> or a new house or a new career or whatever. They wouldn't, in a sense, identify that actually what I need to really flourish is to wake up to what I already have, what is being given to me in many senses. What is given to you moment by moment in our ordinary experiences. And I actually think that the, the mindfulness process is giving us the opportunity to wake up to the extraordinariness of the ordinary in our lives. Yeah? The extraordinariness of the ordinariness of life as it unfolds. Because when we're fixated on getting stuff, you know, being in a particular way, even having, uh, you know, that's a, that striven, striving type goal to get somewhere, we don't see what's right in front of us. We don't see what's right under our noses. The English novelist um, Virginia Woolf once talked about, you know, moments of being. It was, it was a title of a collection of her autobiographical works. And in those works, she often talks about moments of being, moments of real intensity of feeling alive and really being here. Yeah. Almost like, you know, epiphanies, but they're not epiphanies in that sense. They are very ordinary things that she speaks about. So she speaks about, you know, a real moment of being as being the feeling of water on your skin on a hot day. Yeah. How often do we appreciate something as simple as that or the wind in your hair, the cold wind hitting your face? Yeah. The sights and the sounds of our world that we take for granted. These are the sorts of things that we, we often don't affirm, we often don't see you know, in our day-to-day -day existence. And so, yes, it's about changing our lives in the ethical way. Of course, this is vitally important. This is, this is our affirmation also of being with others to live in an ethical way. As, as I said earlier, you know, I think today or perhaps yesterday, ethics makes no sense if we were alone. You know, if we're living on our own, but we don't, we live in community. And actually, this is for the good of all of us that we live in certain ways, which are responsive ways of being towards each other. Yet there is this other layer to human flourishing, which is that deep, deep appreciation of what is given to us. But not given to us, you know, but given to us, actually, I was going to say, in this moment, it's here now for you, yeah, that we can open up to that appreciation, yeah. There is the phrase, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with in Latin, which is carpe diem, you know, which is often translated as seize the day. Actually, the proper translation of it is harvest the day, you know, like reap what is there that's given to you each day as a gift. Yeah, not seizing it and controlling it and trying to determine it in some particular way, but harvesting it in, in what is given to you as the gift. It's, again, just an interesting linguistic thing that in German, and some of you might know German, you know, when you say it is in German, it is es gibt, which es gibt means it gives itself to you. And one of the things I think Christina mentioned this, one of the things that mindfulness is dedicated to is cleaning up our perception. Yeah, because actually in our perception, we're always encountering something other than ourselves, which is giving itself to you. Another human being, another, another object, a tree, 
That's something, this is not just my world. Yeah? This is the encounter with otherness. And this is also what we're waking up to in this moment. I just want to just finish my little section here with, with um, a quotation, if I can find it. Yeah, okay. This is this is a quotation from Rilke out of one of his elegies. You know, again, drawing on something which is non-Buddhist here to say something that's important. He says towards the end, actually, it's in the first page of the elegy, of the first elegy. He says, the springtime needed you. A star was waiting for your eyes. A wave swelled towards you out of the past, or you walked by an open window and a violin surrendered itself to your passion. All that was your duty, but were you strong enough? Weren't you always distracted by expectation? Huh? So he's saying what we do is we don't really hear or see or taste or touch and smell because in some senses our expectation is always taking us out somewhere else just sitting in the way that we're doing on this retreat takes us back into what is happening now but we can even bring expectation to that as you probably well noticed over the course of this christina i'll hand it back to you and I realize we're running out of time, as we often do. But we've spoken about some of the qualities we cultivate that support flourishing of ethics, of contentment. Appreciation is so deeply important. Appreciation needs stillness. If we are lost in the busyness and the swirls of our days, we are often not there to be touched. Again, this is perhaps one of the you know, unforeseen blessings of this more restricted life. You know, I have never seen my garden grow in the way that I have seen my garden grow this year. You know, the, the, the blossoms coming into flower, just being still enough to see that, still enough to hear, to appreciate. I don't know how it is being in your lockdown emergence where you are, but here, you know, to sit down and have tea with a friend outside. This has felt such a luxury. It, it felt like it's something I've almost never done before. We've learned to hold dear, hold close to us, those who are dear to us. I think inspiration is really important for human flourishing. Find what inspires you and love it dearly. Cultivate it. It can change, but find what inspires you to walk in new territories, to, to walk on unfamiliar pathways. It might be in music, it might be in art, it might be in poetry, it might be in ways of developing the practice, it might be in learning. Find what inspires you, I think, and, and love it dearly. Being careful with our attention. I think this is so much part of the, the stillness that allows for appreciation. You know, too often our, our sense doors are in overdrive. You know, too often we live with hungry eyes, hungry ears, hungry minds, you know, always searching for some new stimulation, some new busyness. Be careful with our sense doors. Attend, attend to what we most deeply value. Attend to what opens the doors of stillness rather than closes them. And the last thing that I would mention and really honor as part of human flourishing is community. You know, friendships, none of us do this alone. And there are times we deeply rely upon others and times when others deeply rely upon us. There's times we deeply inspire each other and give confidence to each other. And this I think is, is actually so crucial, the sense of community. It only takes one other person to have a community. And I, and I feel to have really a very, I think, you know, we can be so plagued by self-doubt. I think it's so important to really honor our aspirations, honor the falling away that we see I really have trust and confidence in our capacity to flourish and awaken. 
You know, the Buddha didn't look for perfect meditators. You know, he didn't look for meditation graduates. You know, he, he really sought to support, you know, engage, compassionate, uh, creative human beings fully interfacing with the world around them. Have confidence in our capacity to do this and to really feel that we walk a path rather than have a practice. Okay, that's where I'm ending, John. Okay, and I'll just wrap this up with, in a way, taking us back to where we started yesterday. We started with the body, remember yesterday? Observing the body. Well, actually in this human flourishing is to embody something. Yeah. It's not to have it as just nice ideas. Yeah. The idea of compassion, the idea of stillness, the idea of lack of agitation, you know, idea after idea after idea, which all sound hopefully to you as they do to me, nice ideas. <laughs> but unless they're embodied, you know, that's where the truth of them lies, is actually in our embodiment of them. Um, and to use you know, one of your own poets, an Irish poet, you know, he says, um, W.B. Yeats actually says, we can embody the truth, but we cannot know it. Yeah. That's to live the truth, to live the truth of your experience and the truth and the power of things like kindness and compassion and stillness and all of these things that we talk about as being the foundation of ethical virtues, which are absolutely vitally important for flourishing. We can embody them but they shouldn't just remain as ideas. That embodiment is really important. And if we don't embody them, I think we, we keep them segregated off into something which never really touches our lives. Yeah. So, you know, Christina spoke about earlier on about behavioral aspects. That's a way of embodying it. You know, kindness is embodied, it's there in the gesture. It becomes a responsiveness to being in our world. Compassion is a responsiveness. It's not simply an idea that resides in our head. And we all too often neglect that side, that embodiment side of it. Just to finish off with a, a quotation, I think it's really quite an interesting quotation. It's by Richard Rorty, who's an American philosopher. He said, if the body had been easier to understand, nobody would have thought we had a mind at all. <laughs> That's quite an interesting quote, isn't it? Yeah. Because actually what we talk about is the mind actually is saturated through this physical embodiment. And if we're talking about the fruits of this practice and flourishing, as being the ultimate aspect of, if you like, the fruit of the practice, then it has to be expressible through the body and our body of interaction with others. It's there in our gestures, it's there in our looks, it's there in the way that we hold ourselves and comport ourselves in the world. And I'll finish there. <laughs> so thank you everybody for your, um, attention and for listening.